Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live. My name is Lorna Costantinis, and I'm pleased to co-host the Classroom 2 Live series with Peggy George and Kim Case. Peggy will not be with us today. She's at uh, Q, and she has the honor of presenting an award to Steve Harkinon, the our founder and uh, mentor. He's going to be awarded the Technology and Learning Leadership. Our special guest today is Mark Warren, founder of Finding Dulcinea and Sweet Search, a search engine for students. Each week at this time, we get together to talk about technology tools and issues. And as most of you know, our broadcast is an hour in length, and we record the video, the audio recording, and everything in the chat log. And at the end of our show, or shortly after, we post all the information that you saw today on our website in the archive section at live.classroom20.com. I want to welcome everyone this morning. We're very happy that you're with us. If there is someone new in the chat room today, we hope you watch the Getting Started video. Uh, we want you to know that this is not a tutorial, and we're so happy to have you here. We'll support you. But we are going to have a discussion which is led by the presenter. We also want to make a special note of Tammy Moore, who is in the chat room. And Tammy is so generous to provide us with closed captioning during the session. So if you have someone who uh, has a hearing impairment or someone who's in a different language, I know we had someone else welcoming us last week because they didn't speak English very well, and Tammy did help us. Uh, we, Depending on our time, uh, we'll have open uh, mic time questions. We follow the questions in the chat room. Kim will uh, moderate them as we get through this show. And Mark, I don't know whether you want to take questions as you go or during the session, but we can play that by ear as we do go through it. If you do want to come to the to the mic, we really appreciate it if you'd have a headset on. Otherwise, we're going to get feedback. And please test your audio by running the audio setup wizard under tools, audio, audio setup wizard. Um, just as a quick review, at the bottom of the participants window, you're going to see a series of icons. I want to pay potential, uh, special attention to the door. It simply means if you click on that door, it means you're away from your com computer. You have not actually left the session. To leave the session, you need to shut down Illuminate completely. Also, you'll see uh, raise your hand on the left if you want to be uh, bring yourself to the mic. Uh, you'll see happy faces, uh, applause faces, and over there by the door is the green check and the red X that we're going to ask you to use in a few minutes with our poll questions. So again, welcome everyone, and let's go on to the world map. And if you haven't done so, tell us where you're from in the chat room, or you can take the laser pointer, which is in the left section of the whiteboard. You click on that and click on your location on the world map. Well, take a second, everybody, get your laser pointer and tell us where you are located. I see Virginia's with us again from Italy. Thank you, Virginia, for being with us. Ciao, buongiorno. Lots of people in Canada and the United States. Great. Again, it's wonderful to have such a diverse crowd of people and participants in the chat room. Thank you very much for being with us. We're going to go and move on to our first poll question. Remember you use the red check, that's really good, the green check or the red X to register your vote. Our first poll question today is, have you used the sweet search engine with your students? And if you have yes, green Check no red X. I'll take a minute to let you vote. Let's look at the results. A large number of people with us today have not used the search engine with their students, and so I know, Mark, you're going to have a lot of good information for them. Clear the voting and we'll go to the next poll question. Have you used any of the resources at the Finding Jolchina, excuse me, Jolchina website? I know Mark, you're going to correct my pronunciation there. 
Have you used any of the resources, Green Check or Red X? I think everybody's just about voted, so take a look at the results. 63% have used them, have not used them, pardon me, and 14% have. So again, new learnings and new information today. Our final poll question today is, do you teach research strategies to your students? Green check or red X? Looks like lots of people have and are using them. So let's take a look at the results. There we go, 70% of our participants today do teach research strategies to your students. Great. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating in the poll questions that really, really help our presenter as we go through today. And with that, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce our guest today, Mark Moran. And the topic today is Sweet Search Engine and Research Strategies with Students. So our newbie question, which we're going to ask Mark to now take the mic, introduce himself, and perhaps start with our uh, newbie question and what is a search engine and if you don't answer it now I'm sure you will do so during the show so thank you very much Mark for being with us today let's activate your mic and take over we hope we hope Mark's still hearing this so we need to check Okay, do you hear me now? I do. Ready? Go. Okay. You just have to keep hitting that F2 button. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining with us on a, a Saturday. Um, it's a, a real honor to be here. Um, what is a search engine? A search engine is a tool that literally uh, spiders the web. It crawls the web and it finds websites that it then tags and indexes. And when you put in a search term, it will um, scour all of those sites that it has crawled and will return what it feels is the most relevant information, the most relevant search results in response to your term. And so um, in the case of Google, they, they used to brag about the number of sites they searched and at 5 billion, they stopped even counting. You know, it could be 15 billion, it could be 25 billion that they search. And then, of course, you'll have other search engines. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the concept of a custom search engine that may only search 50 sites because you feel that that's all that you want to search for a particular purpose. Um, Sweet Search is a custom search engine. It's powered by Google, and it searches 35,000 websites. Um, so let me take you through some of the materials. Um, Kim, can we open up the web tour in a moment? So right ahead, do um, open it up and do whatever you would like to show. Okay, very good. Um, so I think the reason almost everybody is here today is because they know that most students cannot use the web effectively. And we've made it the entire mission of our company now to help teachers and librarians teach students how to use the web effectively. We've created all sorts of content and tools uh, in furtherance of that mission. Um, to give you my background, I'm a, a corporate lawyer. I practiced for about 16 years, and uh, the last nine years was at an internet advertising company. We represented about a thousand websites. We sold advertising for them. And so I became very, very familiar with thousands of websites early on. And I always thought that the web would sort of level the playing ground for everybody, that they, everybody would be able to find great information right away using it. And of course, that never quite happened. And so we set about on this mission to index the web a, a little better than we felt search engines had been doing it. Um, I've had a full-time staff of as many as 28 people. We've worked with about 50 outside freelancers, all subject matter experts, uh, probably the majority of them teachers and librarians that helped us create our tools and create our content. Um, 
I don't want to go too much into the, the, the notion that students can't use the web effectively because um, I think everybody is aware of that and that's why they're on their phone. Uh, just to answer a question, this is all absolutely a free service. There is no uh, subscription whatsoever. It's uh, just available on the web. Um, the first thing I want to point you to just quickly uh, is this presentation that we gave to the New York State Conference on the Council on the Social Studies Conference on Thursday. And so if you go to this URL, this is the page that consolidates all of our social studies resources and it has the presentation that we gave. And we did a study of students' web research habits, um, went through some historical studies and everybody's always concluded that students cannot effectively search the web. And um, so we made some recommendations in there. Uh, we'll be augmenting this presentation throughout the weekend since we obviously presented it at a conference with uh, fewer visual, with purely visual cues and fewer words. Um, so you might want to check that out on Monday if you want to further explore that topic. Um, so as I said, uh, and, and then another resource we have for teaching uh, specifically effective research skills is um, 10 tips for researching the web on sweetsearch.com. This consolidates a lot of the learning it links out to URLs if you want more information on the particular tip. Um, some of those links are to our information and some is to the best outside information that we found. The um, first website we created and, and kind of the core of the company is Finding Dulcinea. Um, this is set up as a directory site, um, somewhat similar to about.com perhaps. And what we've done is create three categories of content, web guides, beyond the headlines, and features. I'd like to show you a web guide first. This is what we call the mother web guide. It's how to search the web. If you read this all the way through and really understand it and, and uh, recall everything from it, you may not need anything further. And if you look on in this guide, it says, what is the internet? How do you judge website credibility? How search engine works? Choosing a search engine. So um, it really explains the entire structure of the web um, and, and how it works and how you can navigate it successfully. And then if you look down under more guides on the right, those are all the categories Mark? of guides we have. Yes? We're not seeing that, so can you show another web guide? Okay, I sure can. Do you see the web guide um, coming up to education? It says education school on the web. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So this is a, a category of web guide, and um, I'll expand it so you can read it all. But this is where we put um, all sorts of school, uh, teacher, student, and parent resources for education specifically. And if you go down through, you see we've we've organized it logically and presented it in a in a good fashion, and then we annotate it. We we give advice, we give search strategy advice. Um, is uh, looks like maybe are people struggling to see this, or am I reading old chat messages right now? Um, we're not able to see it, so can you try reloading it? Just typing in or clicking on a different web guide. Okay, I sure can. I know you mentioned earlier that um, the sweet search engine itself is down at the moment. Um, Google is uh, is the, what's behind the search engine and helps to make the search engine work and that uh, you're going to be in contact with them. Otherwise, we'd be showing you that. But we see the high school chemistry resources yep. right now. Okay, great. So we have about 70 categories of, of education web guides. These were all created by um, by teachers. Uh, obviously, this was created by a high school chemistry teacher. Um, and so again, it's listed as resources for students, teaching resources. Uh, in many of the guides, we have what we call um, community resources where we'll link out to Digo's content on it as well. And so it's, it's 
Let me um, go on. For those who are struggling to see it, maybe you could um, just open up a web browser and I'll talk through that and tell you uh, what it is I'm going to. Can, can I just ask you, Mark, do you have tour guide checked? Yes, I do. Okay. Now I can see it. We're doing fine from my point of view. Okay, so I'm back on the Finding Dulcinea home page. So if, if you can't see it, perhaps you can open up a browser and just type in findingdulcinea.com, D-U-L-C-I-N-E-A.com. Looks like it might be cutting in and out for some people. Um, so once we were done creating web guides, we've created about 750 of them. We then created what we call Beyond the Headlines. And what we do in Beyond the Headlines is we take a story uh, that might be in the headlines and find out everything you'd want to know about it. It's, if something happens and we have more questions when we're done reading it than we did when we started it, we would um, like to do a story on it. Um, so if you if you're at findingdulcinea.com, click on Beyond the Headlines, and then go about halfway down, and there's a story that says, as Shamu show goes on, many, many wonder whether it's curtain time. And so, you know, of course, there was the tragedy in uh, SeaWorld. A lot of teach, a lot of students had questions about this. A lot of teachers had questions. We didn't have all the answers. So what we'll do is, is explain the context for why we're talking about it. We'll explain the incident that happened and the immediate reaction, them uh, coming back and uh, restarting the show. And then we give what we call background. And every way you see these blue hyperlinks, that's us linking out to the web resource where we found it. So if you then look at the sources in the story box that I've scrolled down to, those are all the sources we've gone out to find background information on this story. Um, and, and in fact, this is why uh, Sweet Search, I think, is a particularly effective search engine. If you search Orca in Google, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of URLs with the word Orca in it. And it's uh, Orca Island, Orca Store, Orca.net, Orca.org. You know, you end up sounding like uh, Bubba in, in Forest Gump talking about shrimp. It's just every kind of orchid in the world. And most of those resources are not helpful to students. But when I use Sweet Search, two of the top ten results were from PBS. And one was a, a, a nature program that explained a fascinating aspect of, of killer whales. And one was called Frontline, called the Whale of the Business. And again, that was about the 12th reserve, result in Sweet Search. It might have been the hundredth result uh, in Google, or it may, you know, may have been on the twentieth page, and students aren't going to find that. And um, how did you so, get to that part, Mark? You typed in orca in the quick search box. Uh, no, no, no. To to looking at the the Shamu story on the screen right now. Uh huh. Yeah, I just scrolled down to it. But what I said is that to to find all these links, I did just go to Sweet Search and put in orca. Okay. Okay. okay, but as, as Kim said, Sweet Search is having a problem at an unfortunate time right now. Google kind of shut it down yesterday. Um, to answer the question, what's the relationship between Sweet Search and Finding Dulcinea? I'll, I'll explain that in a, in a second. Let me just finish explaining Finding Dulcinea, and then you'll immediately understand what Sweet Search is. <clears throat> Um, so, so these are we've we've written about 10,000 news articles like this on uh, finding Dulcinea. Um, many of them are education related. We we want to provide stories that are of great interest to educators. I'm going to browse by that topic for education, and you'll see stories come up that will all will all be of great interest to teachers. And again, we take a headline story. And then we kind of run with it. We we find um, more links to it. Here there was a story about Facebook. A lot of people are using it, but they're using aliases so that they can't be found except by people that they want to be found by. And so these are some of the other education-related stories that we've done recently. And again, the same approach. It might be seven links 
that we found on the web relating to this topic, and we kind of weave them all together into a single narrative to give you a full view. Um, we have uh, our feature section. The heart of that is what we call um, Happy Birthday. Uh, we also do, obviously, Women's History Month is of great interest to people. I uh, saw so someone say that they were studying the Salem Witch Trials right now, so I just pulled that article up. And if you, you know, look down again, you'll see the sources in the story. We found something on Smithsonian Magazine, the University of Virginia's website, the PBS, National Geographic. These are all the kind of sources you want your students using. Uh, they are the kind of sources you're going to find in Sweet Search, and you won't so find Mark, any. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. That's uh, okay. So, they, if you scroll down the page, all of these references, and wherever there's a, a heading, those are re search results. Uh, th these aren't search results. It, it's okay. Looking looking at the sources in the story box, we went and found all these okay. articles, and we read all these articles. And from okay. what we from what we learned in those articles, we created this article. I see. Okay. Okay. And so okay. in this first paragraph, Salem Mass is the site of one of the most gruesome moments. On the fifth line, you see a blue hyperlink. If you click on that hyperlink, it will take you to exactly where we found this information. Um, and okay. usually that will be the first source. So we got all the first two paragraphs we took out of the Smithsonian Magazine. Not, not literally copied, we use that as the source. Uh, we then go on to discuss the crucible and where that fits into the picture. And there's a blue hyperlink. Clearly we took that from the second source in the story. We then go on to talk about information we found on the University of Virginia's website, and so that's the third source in our story. So that, that's how we create every article you find on Finding Dulcinea. Um, and so, you know, we write these all to be maybe six or seven hundred words. We don't want them to be 20,000 words like some Wikipedia entries might be. We want to give students enough of an overview of the story that they can learn from this and then they can go look at these links themselves and create their own article. Uh, just jumping back, um, happy birthday is kind of the core of this. We profile an inspiring person every single day. Uh, who is writing the articles? Generally, it's our full-time, almost always, it's our full-time research staff. And if you go and look um, look on our site, you can see what their background is. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Someone just wrote, yeah, these are absolutely great models for students to write their own resources. Um, importantly, in the Beyond the Headlines articles that we talked about, um, they are intended to be as neutral as they can be and to find opposing viewpoints on every controversial issue. Uh, we have people from every um, sort of political, philosophical, and social stripe in the company, and we, if there's a controversial article, we make sure everybody in the company is happy with it, that everybody thinks it fairly represents the issue. So I think it's a, a really good resource for students. Um, so on happy birthday, again, we give a brief biography about somebody, what their notable accomplishments are, in other words, why we care that we're reading the story, and where they are today. And actually 90% of these we write are for people who are uh, long deceased. So we try and provide a good balance of people. If you look here, these are the kind of people we've been writing about whose birthdays were just in this last week. And so they're from all sorts of time periods, all sorts of parts of the world, um, men, women, every race, every nationality. And it goes from, you know, Madame Shanghai Czech to Harry Belafonte to Mary Lyon, who's the founder of Mount Holyoke, and Johnny Cash. Um, Mary Lyon was a particularly interesting story. She was not allowed to go to school as a child, so she sat on the stoop and listened through the doors, learned enough to then go and start her own school. Um, uh, which is now Mount Holyoke. So we have a lot of great uh, people here. Um, we've actually amassed probably over a thousand 
of these biographies, and so to make them very easy to access, we created Sweet Search biographies. So if you go to sweetsearch.com slash biographies, you'll see that. And what you can do here is look at the categories on the left. Um, and so if you, uh, it's Women's History Month, of course, we'll click on women and you'll see just our index of all women. Does everyone see that page right now? Try refreshing that page okay. by okay. clicking on it and then clicking, pressing enter again. Okay. Yeah, uh, again, if, if anybody's typing directly, sweetchurch.com slash biographies will bring you to the biographies homepage, which I see right now. Does everyone see that? Uh, if someone asks what age group this is for, um, we think it's uh, extremely useful for, I would say, sixth graders to early college. Um, I think it would also be somewhat helpful in the younger grades. Um, certainly, Sweet Search, when I explain it, is a lot better than Google for younger students. And we are coming out with a Sweet Search junior version sometime in the next 45 to 60 days that will be really useful for first to sixth graders. Um, so I'm looking at the biography page, which I hope many people can see. But as I click on women, what you'll get is only a list of all the women that we've covered in Happy Birthday and other biography features we've done on the site. Does, does, do people see that now? Okay, great. It looks like a lot of people are seeing it. So here are all the women, but now there's still an awful lot of them. Maybe you want to filter them again. So let's just filter for African-American women. And now you see just that. Um, I can see it looks like it's cutting in and out for people, but suffice to say you can search for just women, then just African-American women, and then just African-American women who are activists and that will list uh, just that page. And if you click on any one of these, what you're going to get is um, our happy birthday result of that person. Um, like uh, the server's having some issues here. But so um, that's, that's what you'll get there. Um, okay. Let me uh, move on now. So people asked, what's the difference between finding Dulcinea and Sweet Search? And the, um, let me just, I'm sorry, show you one more blog post I wrote about Sweet Search biographies. Hopefully everyone will be able to see. Uh, can you see the blog entry that's up right now? It says Beyond Jackie and Rosa. No, we're, okay, not, this, we're not seeing it, Mark. Do you have the URL that we can drop in the... Uh, in you know which, what it is, the tour guide thing checked off. Okay. Okay. Can we see it now? Yes, I can see it. Okay. I don't know why that unchecked. Excellent. Okay, so this explains um, the impetus for Sweet Search biographies. I talked about how my, uh, my daughter came home and was asked to write about a woman from Asia, Africa, or South America, and the teacher said, every time I give this, 90% of the people want to write about Mother Teresa and essentially beg them to find somebody new. So my daughter and I sat down and used Happy Birthday to find uh, Wangari Muda Matai, who was the first woman from Africa to win a Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, just knocked the teacher's socks off when she turned that in. So that's what gave rise to Sweet Search Biographies. And when I introduced it for Black History Month, the school librarian was so pleased because, as she said, there are so many more inspiring people in black history than just Jackie and Rosa. 
and she'd love to see, um, you know, all the other people that are deserving of having students write about them. And so, again, if you go to Sweet Search Biographies, sweetsearch.com slash biographies, um, which it looks like it may be having a little bit of a problem today, but it won't last for very long. Um, you can sort by women, you can sort by African American, you can sort by athletes, by activists, and, um, and find great people to write about. Uh, did Joyce Valenza help with this? She's a, a very good friend of the company and has consulted with us um, on a steady basis. So um, I would say pretty much anything you see here, she in a way has helped with. But she did write a very nice um, review of it as well. Um, I want to show you briefly on Contrando Dulcinea. For those of you who have um, students whose native language is Spanish, I think this could be a really helpful tool. Um, this is all of the content that we've created, in other words, our articles, our web guides, our happy birthday features, we've translated that into Spanish. Um, it still provides links to the best um, uh, English language links, but at least it provides the guidance in Spanish. So I think you'll find this really helpful that way. Um, I think this is very useful for students whose native language is Spanish, uh, especially for their parents. Um, and um, even for students who are learning to speak Spanish and want to speak English. You see on the right, um, Hoya and La Historia is um, the Dred Scott decision today. Well, if you go to Finding Dulcinea, you'll find that in English. And if you come to Encontrando Dulcinea, you're going to find it in Spanish. And so students can read them side by side. Um, I think this is especially helpful if you're trying to teach a recent Spanish immigrant about the Dred Scott case, well, heck, you can let them read it in Spanish before you try and make them read it in English. Um, and I think, yeah, I think people are asking about the translations. Uh, what I would call these are transliterations. Um, in other words, I handed them to someone whose native language was Spanish but had learned English very well. Um, a woman from Chile has done most of these. She went to school up here. She went to college for four years. Um, to Harvard, but is from Chile. And I told her I want these written in a way that a Spanish person is going to understand. I do not want, um, uh, you know, a specific, a perfect translation which may be undecipherable to a Spanish person. Uh, so somebody asked, uh, so is it that the Finding Dulcinea resources are searchable through Sweet Search? Um, the answer is yes, and, and then some. Um, if you search on Finding Dulcinea or on Encontrando Dulcinea, you're going to find primarily our articles that we've written. But when you use Sweet Search, you not only search our content, you always search, you also search the 35,000 websites that we've ever referenced, plus additional sites that we've chosen to add. And so, you know, everybody's familiar with all sorts of educators that create the 10, um, 10 top websites for this or 25 top websites for that. When we see those lists, we go through them ourselves. We often find we already have most of those sites in Sweet Search, but if we don't, we evaluate them. And if we agree with their evaluation, we then include them in Sweet Search. Um, I also went and looked through the entire .gov file and was happy with the credibility of all those sources, so they're all automatically in here. Um, interestingly, the .edu and the .org files have become rather corrupted, and there are a lot of less credible sites in those, so I have not included all of those. I you know, went through them one by one to include them. And then any sites we come across that we find are really terrific, but for some reason we haven't yet referenced in Finding Dulcinea, we add to Sweet Search. So we add uh, probably 500 sites a week. Um, somebody asked whether the references come from global resources. Absolutely, that's, that's often the case. We, uh, we get a lot of our story ideas from overseas because we're trying to bring stories to people's attention before, um, 
you hear about it here. So if we read about a story in an Australian paper or a British paper, we'll often pick that up and run with it. Um, somebody asked about a cite this button that is coming uh, probably in the next week. Um, that in specific response to a group of educators that I spoke to. Um, so the next thing I wanted to show was um, Sweet Search itself, but as um, as we explained before, there's a, there's been a bit of a problem with Sweet Search today. So I'll show you what the home page looks like, but sadly the um, search functionality is not currently working. Obviously, I'd urge you to come back on Monday. Uh, the good news is you can spend the rest of your Saturday on your personal life and not testing Sweet Search. Um, I did create a blog post that explains it very well that fortunately is uh, available today and I think explains it even better than testing it out would. So I'm pulling that up. Does everybody see why Sweet Search is the best search engine for students? Terrific. So this is a, a blog post that I put up that explains how we created it in, in great detail. Um, and then it goes and actually compares search results on Sweet Search, Google, and Bing and explains why we think search, Sweet Search is the best. Now, of course, unfortunately, if you click on Sweet Search there, you're not going to actually see the results today, but you will by Monday. Um, what I explain is that on the war for a topic such as the War of 1812, um, Google thinks that for most results we want really recent sites. Something that was created in the last year or so, even in the last week or so, might be more relevant than something created five years ago. Of course, if you're searching a topic like War of 1812, that's not really true. So the second, of course, with Google, the first result is always going to be Wikipedia. Um, the second was Gateway New Orleans and it had a, a nice 500 word description of the War of 1812. But I think the most important question anyone can ask when they're evaluating a website is who wrote this and why did they write it? And the why here is because they want you to come to New Orleans in two years to celebrate the bicentennial of the war. And you know, so they're not interested in advancing the scholarship of the War of 1812. So what you want to do is go find a site that does have that as its purpose. Um, also, there's often very specific URLs like war of 1812.ca and .net that rank very high. Um, and um, that's because of their URL. But these sites are what I call passion sites. They're put up by people who are very interested in the topic, but they have no academic credentials. They don't have journalistic credentials. They're just putting up to get something that sounds really good and a lot of people link to it as a result because it is it is well written, but again, there's no journalistic or academic integrity behind it. So we won't link to those. They'll rank very high in Google. They'll confuse your students uh, who won't understand why you don't want them to use it. If you go down to the paragraph that you see right at the top of the screen right now, we'll tell you what you'll find on Sweet Search. The first results of the Library of Congress's entire collection of primary source documents on the war. I can't find that on Google. I think it's on the sixth to tenth page perhaps because I've been looking and looking and can't even find it. There's a ThinQuest, there's a U.S. military site, and then what really is the magic of Sweet Search? There's a lot of really terrific sites created by university professors but for a general audience about African American freedom fighters, political cartoons, the Star Spangled Banner. Those don't rank very well in Google because their authors don't make any effort to game the system and make them rank high. And so the, the sites of the people who, who do that rank much higher than these fantastic university sites. On Sweet Search, these end up on the first page. They'll end up somewhere between the fourth to seventh page on Google and as you know, if it's on the fourth page, your students aren't finding it. Uh, we present the results of Sweet Search uh, for Shakespeare. Same kind of thing. A lot of passion sites on Google, only sites with academic integrity on Sweet Search. I um, want to talk also just quickly about a 
another tool we created called Finding Education. It's a, another free product. It's very, very simple. And here's a demonstration page I showed, which will come up shortly. This is a combination of a bookmarking tool, kind of like a, a Digo or a Delicious, and a blog. And if you create an account on Finding Education, you go in on the back end and you either find links that other teachers have saved or find links using Sweet Search. You save them to your library and then you can publish them to an assignment using a tool that's very much like a blog. So that's a, a brief explanation of that. And of course, go to FindingEducation.com. You'll find a lot more. Uh, yes, Finding Education is part of the same company. These are all our, um, all of our tools. Uh, one thing that I think everybody should be aware of is, um, you know, you want to teach um, 21st century skills. We've created something called the On This Day Challenge that we feature on Finding Education um, where we ask students to actually create their own uh, On This Day, just like the ones that we showed you before. Um, and so here's um, how can students can do it. Uh, we give a lot of advice if you look on the left for uh, teaching age, how to do it, how to research, how to evaluate websites for it, how to cite or source. And uh, we're actually going to make it even easier to enter. enter. You'll see something uh, next week that there will be alternative ways to enter. But if there are any really well done on this days, we'll publish them on our site as student work. Um, we think that will be uh, obviously very exciting for students. And um, we also have monthly prizes and year-end prizes for people that actively participate. So students can write this as individuals. They can do it as a group. You, know, you can have five students um, assigned to write one of these together. Uh, we just want students to start picking up, um, you know, the skills, 21st century skills. And we think this is sort of the ultimate 21st century um, exercise. I think I might have skipped on this day now that I'm um, saying I've shown it to you. So let me show that to you right now. This is back on Finding Dulcinea. This is uh, my reaction to those newspaper lists you see every day of events in history where they hardly tell you a darn thing about what really happened. They just list it. Um, the board should be up. Is anybody having, can people see this now, the On This Day category page? Looks like many can. Some are getting a server error. Okay. Kim put up the link. And so on, on this day in 1857, uh, the Dred Scott decision was, was issued. If you look down, you'll see some of our other uh, recent on this days, the Boston Massacre, the Iron Curtain speech. We go back all the way to 1461 with uh, the War of the Roses. Um, we try and mix this up with a bit of contemporary stories. There's the first bombing of the World Trade Center and the Rodney King incident, uh, as well as stuff from 1400 and 1700 and 1800. And of course, we, we treat these in the same way um, that we do all of our articles. If you see the page now, um, again, look down at the sources in the story. These are the sources we found to create this article. This is the article that we wrote, and everywhere you see a blue hyperlink, this is us reaching out, uh, linking out to the source where we found the information. Um, we'll provide some other links for you. If there's a controversy, we try and cover both sides of the controversy, I think. Dred Scott, while it was controversial at the time, I think almost everybody agrees it was wrong now, so we probably didn't dwell too much into that. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to show. Okay, Sweet Sites. This is a tool really ideally for, um, for teachers, but is, uh, I think in particular for librarians. Uh, does everyone see the Sweet Sites homepage now? Okay, great. So you see there are tools for teachers and for students. 
I think probably the most popular one that we're coming out with soon is for parents. Um, what a lot of this is is links to some of the material you saw in the web guides. So I'm going to click on for teachers, high school. These are links from web guides that we've created. So we start on the top with English literature, English poetry, English books. Often it'll be the top, the, the best five links we found in the web guide. And then the last one is the web guide itself. So school library sites are free to link to this or incorporate it into their site any way they want. Um, it's kind of a, a quick look if you're, you know, a biology teacher. Here's five great biology links and you can look at that. Um, somebody asked whether it's funded by advertising or elsewhere. Uh, well, I mean, we've, we've got plenty of private funding for it. And um, it is funded by advertising. And we're also looking at some other revenue models. But we certainly do plan to be around in five years and, and for a lot longer than that. Um, I'm looking at this as something that I want to run for 20 years. Um, and, and I've got a lot of experience running a company. I was with a, an internet advertising company that went through one of the wildest rides over 10 years um, and, and were one of the few to survive all that. Um, so this is the high school teachers web links uh, or sweet sites is what we call it now. Uh, this one for high school, middle school, and elementary school uh, for students and for teachers. And on the elementary school, if you see me, it looks like I lost the Jura guide. I just clicked it back on. Uh, somebody asked if we click on the Amazon link. Yes, that's Amazon is our primary advertiser. So if you click on Amazon and, and bought something through there, that would be helpful to us. Um, and, and all of the advertising we have has nothing to do with influencing the content, and it's all kind of student safe. Um, I have three children myself between fourth grade and tenth grade, and all of their friends use the sites, and the local school district is all actively using it. So. Um, you know, I'm going to make sure, and my wife is sure going to make sure that there's no inappropriate advertising for students on this. Um, so we hope to keep expanding this. If you have any topics that we haven't covered here, let us know and we'll include them. If there are any great resources we're not including, let us know and we'll include them. And we, we do tend to keep expanding it um, across all levels. And um, absolutely, uh, we'll create a, a parents page, which I think will be really good for you to point parents to as well. Um, so I think that's all I was planning to present. I did obviously want to run through some sweet searches, but uh, obviously that will have to wait till Monday. We had this problem with Google once before, and they always seem to break it on a weekend. And um, <laughs> It's very hard to get in touch with them on the weekend. You would think a company that size um, would, would be better supporting you on the weekend, but, but they're not. But we'll, uh, we'll get it right by Monday. Um, so I'd like to open it up to questions now. I'm just looking at the, um, the chat line. Hire me. I love this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're right, welcome. Yeah. Is, is Amazon the only uh, advertising that you have on the site at the moment? Um, it's not the only one. It's the primary one. Um, I want to be very careful about introducing advertisers. Um, we, we did have Google AdSense on before, which every newspaper in the country has. And, and some of the advertisements were just awful. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we're putting, we're putting too much work into this to scare people off with ads. And so, well, you know, I, I know, yeah. you know, I'm very familiar with the internet advertising industry. There are a lot of places you can get only high quality ads, and that's that's what we're going to do. Um, on some of the other categories like sports or health, you'll see some other ads that come specifically from someone who just sells sports ads or just sells health ads. Yeah. yeah. 
I see a great quote there. They never want to see another get rid of belly fat ad again, and I certainly feel the same way. I don't want to put all this effort into uh, what we're doing. Here's an ad for Champion. You know, those are the kind of ads you're going to get on our um, sports uh, sports sites and health sites will also be, you know, ad there and, mm -hmm. and things of that sort. Uh, I'm not sure who this is, but it's probably a pharmaceutical ad or it looks like it might be a beauty ad. Um, but you're, you will never see belly fat ads on this site. You will never see um, any of those ads at all. I did just see a Google AdSense tag, but that was coming from our health advertising provider, so that's unlikely to be offensive to anybody. So they're family-friendly ads then? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's fantastic. If, yeah. If there are other, ever not, I'll take them right down. Um, I'm putting my email address in. I'd love to answer any questions from anybody at any time, so feel free to contact me. and. Um, we do have a free daily newsletter you can sign up for, which will send you, you know, we'll push out our on this day content to you. Um, uh, it's right on our homepage. If you see um, right here, newsletter sign up. And uh, we don't spam you. We don't ever share it with anyone. Again, we're working too hard to develop these relationships to, to screw them up. Uh, there's almost certainly not a word coming from this site. Um, so I love uh, I love more people to sign up for the newsletter. We had uh, two teachers in the last two weeks that said they've been receiving it for two months. They absolutely love it, and they want to sign up all of their students as well. And so they've encouraged them to do that. I think we had 105 people sign up on Monday, and I think it was those two classes together. Um, it's mostly on this day. It's also um, links to some of our other content, our stories. Um, someone again asked, how do we monetize the site? And again, it's all through advertising um, and private, uh, you know, venture capital funding. And, uh, and, and someone the, asked, I'm, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Yep. Someone asked about, are the site images, are they Creative Commons licensed? And the students can download and cite the source. Uh, no, those um, these are often licensed from uh, Associated Press. Unfortunately, they're they're kind of a mix. I can't generally say about any one of them. Although, you know, you often we'll put a caption uh, saying who it's from. Um, let me try and find a way to address that so that we can tell you when it is uh, in the public domain and can be used. Absolutely. Yeah, if someone said fair use may work. Which, fair use. Yeah, I, I would I would think so. Uh, on this yeah. day, yes, it can be yeah. embedded. Fair there use is guidelines in the classroom. Yeah. There is a widget for Sweet Search that can be embedded on the website. Uh, if you click on sweetsearch.com, there's a get the widget. There's also one for on this day and happy birthday, and they are on um, widget box. Um, let's see if I can. Oh, those find are them. fantastic! If you could bring in that content from widget. Yeah, widget we've box. had. Um, We've had lots and lots of schools in the last um, few weeks um, putting up widgets for both of them, uh, particularly the Sweet Search. But um, looks like you need to sign in to Widget Box to get the widget. Um, I'm going to bring that forward to our homepage so you can more easily find that. So early next week we'll put that up. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think okay. that would be a terrific thing for for. Library, school library sites, or history, or, or general teachers to put up. Absolutely, on a wiki page or on a class website or school website, I think those would definitely be of great value <clears throat> right. and would definitely be used. And we've had several librarians, including Joyce, on our show, and many are addicted to widgets and providing mm -hmm. content for their students with widgets. Uh, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, no, they absolutely love them, and, and you know, she was instrumental in encouraging us to do to widgetize everything we could. Um, good, maybe good. we'll do a, a widget for the blog as well, because the blog, again, we've turned entirely towards um, producing articles that should be interesting to students and teachers. And so let me see if we can do one for that as well. Um, if you look here, it's on the screen now. Top level domains, not as useful as quills commonly believed. Um, that's you know where I found out that the dot orgs um, and and the, the dot edus aren't as pure as people thought. Um, here's one I'm clicking on, finding the real source of your source, and it talks about the problem that sometimes you'll find something on one site, but it's been you know kind of copied forward eight times. And it's how do you find out who the real source is? And that is so important so. to teach students to evaluate the credibility and the reliability of the content. And that, you know, all of these things that you're sharing in ways to teach students how to research effectively, you know, we do that, but it's hard to demonstrate and find resources to really conceptualize that topic and that concept for students and I think these will be fantastic visual ways to try and get that across to students. Right, right. We have um we have a really great article that somebody wrote on here about being in her friend's basement and finding newspapers from eighteen from nineteen forty. And it talked about the Great War in Europe and how the U.S. was absolutely determined to stay out of it. And of course, if you then wrote something based on what you found in that newspaper, you'd look kind of silly. Um, and she said the same can be true if um, you find a four-year-old article on the Internet. So then she wrote a blog post on how to, um, you know, find the date of something. So as you see, all of these uh, articles on the blog are really education-oriented right now. and and geared towards helping you um, improve web research. And so we'll, uh, we'll put out a widget for that. Um, there's one here on primary source materials and why it's so important and how you find them, how you use our site to find them. So I think there's all sorts of great stuff on there. And, and, and we're determined to produce a lot more content on the blog as well. Amazing. Uh, I just I am just so grateful that you guys have done this and, you know, put out this labor of love for all of the educators and students, you know, to to use. I just think this is fantastic. And Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and formally close out the, flow, the show. I know that people have to go, but we do hope that you'll stay and that Mark will be able to stay on a little bit longer and then we can continue to ask Mark some specific questions. So I'm going to I'll, pull out the uh, I'll web. Stay, I'll stay for as long as you have questions. Super. And we want to announce that on March 13th, we'll be having a very special guest, Adora Seatak. She's, I think, 12 years old now. And she's going to be presenting on engaging students with interactive technology. So we hope that you will join us for that session. And if you haven't heard her, she is just fantastic in the ways that she uses technology and helps her teachers and, and presents all over the world. And she's currently um, been asked by the TED people to create a presentation for the TED site. And on Tuesday, March 9th, Steve Hargadon will be interviewing Bernard Robin on educational uses of digital storytelling, part of the Merlot series. And that will be at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. And on Wednesday, March the 10th, Steve will be interviewing Jim Gimmel and Gordon Bell on Total Recall, part of the Conversations.net series. And that will be at the same time, 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. Oops, and I forgot to bring that down where you can read it. And it's copyright and fair use in the art world and in the classroom. That should be very interesting, talking about the images that we just were referring to earlier. 
on Wednesday, it should be Thursday, March the 11th at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. And on the same date, it'll be Sharon Peters on Teachers Without Borders. And there's on Thursday, March the 11th at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern. The previous one on copyright is part of the PBS series, and this one is part of Steve Hargett on Future of Education series interviews. There will be a survey that opens up at the end of the session, and we hope that you'll give us feedback and suggest future topics. And we know we had some difficulties with the web tour. It takes a while to load and to catch up. Some days it's slower than others. But we hope that you'll continue to give us great feedback and ideas for um, suggestions for future topics. And if you'd like our certificate for today's, um, if you're reviewing the video, the full recording, or if you are in the live sessions, you can input your name and, and email address on the survey link that pops up. And if for some reason the survey link doesn't pop up, or you're not able to uh, access it, you can always email us at live or live at classroom20.com is our email address that you can email us and let us know you didn't get the certificate or the survey link or you watched the video and you'd like to get a certificate. And we would like to extend a very special thanks to Mark Moran for joining us today and for Steve Hargadon, who is the founder of Classroom 2.0 and Future of Education and Conversations.net and a few other sites. And thank you to each of you who participated in the show today and shared links and ideas, and especially to Illuminate and Learn Central for providing this forum for us each and every week for us to learn and grow about all kinds of topics related to education. So now I'm going to pass it back to Mark. And if you have a question that you would like to ask Mark, you can do so. You can type it in the chat, or you can click on the hand with the green arrow, and then we will take your question and give you the microphone so that you can ask your question directly to Mark. So if there are any questions, go ahead and let us know. Does anybody have a question that they would like to ask that I might have missed from the session? And Peggy, great question. She is presenting um, to Steve Hargadon. She's presenting, um, giving him the award at the Q Conference, the Teaching or Learning and Leadership Award. I forgot the exact name. I apologize. And she is the lucky one. To, to be there to see him receive the award and, and give him the award. So we're very grateful that we have such a fantastic mentor and that she's uh, she'll be back with us next week. And Mark, our, what is your motivation for providing these resources for educators to use for free? Um, you know, it's that, you know, I've, I've had a, a good career already. Um, I sort of feel like we've made all the money we need to make. Um, we're, we're set up okay here, and um, I do think we can we can make some money on this site. Um, I don't want to charge for it because then it's not going to be available to anyone who can't pay for it. Um, and I also want to build as big an audience as I can for it. You know, we're putting a lot of work into this, so I want everyone to be able to, to see it and use it. Uh, you know, and not just those who can pay $9.99 a month or whatever you might want to charge. Um, you know, I, I just, because of the career I had, it was always critically important to me to be able to do good research and to, to find the absolute best information I could on a topic. And I'll, I'll never forget the first, probably 1996, I was asked to find something while working for a law firm that a bank had asked us, and it was about an instrument that nobody knew anything about. It was so new. And I found a website about it. I, I was, think I was the first person in the law firm to ever look on the web for something. And it answered the question, and I look good, and 
I thought, oh, this web is going to be great. Everybody's just got to go to the web and find all this great information. And of course, there is a lot of great information on the web. There's 100,000 sites as useful as that one I found right now. But there are 50 million that are not useful. And I sadly learned that most people can't tell the difference between the good ones and the bad ones. And so we're doing our best to help them learn to tell the difference. And that's a great point because students think that if it's on the internet, it's true and it's accurate. Exactly. Yeah, you, know, you know, I I think sending people to Sweet Search instead of Google is like sending them to the library for a book instead of telling them to find it themselves on Amazon. You know, I looked I looked before and I found there were twenty four hundred books on Martin Luther King and 3,400 on the War of 1812 and 62,000 on Shakespeare. So you can't really send a student to Amazon to find a book. Um, I think it's the same with Google. Um, what Sweet Search lets a student do is see a page full of results that are great. And it lets them actually take the time to look through each one and find the one that's most relevant without worrying about whether they're credible. And that's, that's the way I learned in school. You know, I went to the library, was told, here's the dictionaries, here's some books, here's some other resources. It's all good stuff. You find what's relevant to your research. And so to, to kind of throw a child out into the wilds of Google and ask them to be able to differentiate between the good stuff and the bad stuff when, when a lot of it is cleverly cloaked, um, I, I think is, is too much. I think it's a good exercise to do a few times a year but I know my own kids, you know, they come home from sports and Girl Scouts and out with friends and, you know, they have four hours of homework. You can't ask them to be evaluating a dozen websites, eight of which are of not, of not of any use to them, you know, all night long. I think there's just some life experience needed really to be able to use Google effectively. You, you, need, you need to be able to identify people with biases or interests that are not your interests. And you can't do that when you're 15 years old. You think everybody's out there to help you. Exactly. Exactly. It's just um, very thin. I just can't, you know, say enough about the great service that this is providing for students and for educators. So, so that, um, you know, it saves a lot of work for us as educators because we can using those web guides we can have students access the web guides and you know search through quality resources that have been approved by educators and consultants and content experts and rely that anything that the students find on the website or use through the search engine the sweet search engine will be, you know, safe for students to use and, and that's important and that isn't out there. No, you know, absolutely. I, I, it's definitely not out there and may and compiled is and is easy to use as your website. Right, absolutely. Um an interesting thing I saw last week, um Dana Boyd from the Berkman Center um put out a really interesting report on how we can help students and she said that you know, we could try kids-friendly search engines and browsers, but kids don't want to use what they think is a kid's tool. They want what the adults are using. And Sweet Search was actually built as a tool for adults. And so I think when they see it, they don't think of it as, you know, a kiddie thing. I think they'll see it as just, you know, an improvement on Google. Um, you know, I do want to point out this is not like, um, you know, maybe a kid's click where, Search, return, search uh, queries are blocked or anything like that. If people put in, you know, maybe sexuality-based terms, they will get results if they're in our index, but they'll get it from information sites, from the New York Times, and anybody else in our index that's discussing it. Um, they, they, of course, will not get anything gratuitous or, or you know, what we have called adult sites. That is not anywhere near it. Um, but we are creating Sweet Search Junior for maybe the younger set of if, you know, you want first and second and third graders. Of course, hopefully they're not searching on terms like that anyway. <laughs> but what you will get from Sweet Search, as I said, is information-based results for those terms. 
And Teddy brought up an image search tool would be great also. I think that's a great idea. It is, uh, for some reason, Google doesn't provide that in their custom search yet, and they're ambivalent about whether they will. And I think we uh, may go around them and find um, somebody else instead um, uh, to, to, to provide kind of curated image search. I think that would be really useful. Yeah, um, I think it would be too. Um, Sherry Edwards wrote that she's in the middle of a research project and even though they've learned website evaluations, the kids still want to believe unbelievable sites. Um, and on, in the presentation we did the other day, there was a study, I think it was fifth or sixth graders in the Netherlands, and they found exactly the same thing, that kids were taught for several days about information literacy and how to evaluate a website. They then went and used Google, and they looked at the first three sites. They did no evaluation whatsoever. They just, whatever was in the first three sites was what they turned in. Um, it just seems to be a step they have difficult processing at the moment. Um, so that's that's why we and think Sweet Search is particularly useful. And it can be human nature sometimes to, you know, do what's easiest to get the, the job done with the least minimal effort. So if whatever the three sites or first couple of sites are that come up, they're going to go with it regardless of whether it's accurate and good content relevant to their topic. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's why searching a curated pool is, is really the way to go. I think, I think librarians and teachers should do more to just hand students a list. Okay, here's, here's 10 sites relating to this topic. You can only search these sites. You can't search Google. And, and yes, make them that's use what this, I used to do. Mm -hmm. yeah, make them use the site's internal search function to find what's relevant on the site. Um, but I think you know I think that, that the three critical steps are making them plan the search. You know, students are not planners. Make them think about the keywords, come up with a strategy. And this is all covered in the presentation we put up on sweetsearch.com slash social studies. And so let's make them plan. Um, you know, somebody said to me that kids aren't allowed near the computer until they approve the keyword list, um, until the, the teacher approves the keyword list. And then the second one is the right place to search. And as we know, it's not always Google, or certainly not Google alone. You know, you should make them search two, three, four, five search engines. Um, and actually, on Sweet Search, when you search and see the Sweet Search results, there's a little radio button to go to Google so that you don't even put the search term in again. You put Shakespeare and Sweet Search, you see the results, and then you just click the Google button and then you see the Google results. Um, and of course, there's a lot of meta search engines like Dogpile and Zula, Z-U-U-L-A, that will search you know, five or ten search engines at once. Uh, and then the third step, of course, is evaluation where, as we've been saying, students don't really care to um, take that step. Mm -hmm. Yes, unfortunately. But um, I haven't seen anything that um, online or anywhere that compiles the resources that are completely approved. I know NetTracker does that to some degree, but NetTracker last I was when I was in the classroom and stuff, it was rather expensive to subscribe and use the net trucker search engine although uh -huh. they you know offer great things you know it's sometimes cost prohibitive and you cannot and budgets just aren't allowing for that nowadays right right yeah no it's getting harder and harder for schools to afford that service Definitely. You know, we'd love feedback on anything you find in Sweet Search. If you ever do find anything inappropriate, which you know, or not, you know, let us know. Um, and if you can think of sources that are not in there that should be, we'd like to know that as well. We, uh, I spend much of my weekend looking for more resources for Sweet Search. Probably at 500 That's sites a week. Point that, yeah, yeah, that you can laugh at the inaccuracies and. We did a show in the past on the allaboutexplorers.com website where uh -huh. it's kind of a 
farce and satirical uh, content that the students would research and do web quests, and then they have to determine what is accurate and what isn't. Like um, one of them, uh, I can't remember, but it was like Christopher Columbus checked his, used his cell phone or, you know, to call somebody or something like that. You know, that obviously if the students are thinking about what was offered in 1492, cell phones were not around. So, you know, just to help students really bring out the idea that they need to be critical and thinking and critical readers when they're evaluating this information. Right. I'll type that address in. It's it's hilarious. I I just think, you know, I crack up whenever I read that site. Mm -hmm. And our, um, the show is in our archives. Carol, if you wanted to go back and explore the resources as well as the recording, because we had the two um, developers on. And if you read their bios, their bios are bizarre too. And then they give you the link to their real bios. But um, it, it's just, it's all along the same content. It's really hilarious and funny. And thanks for putting your Twitter address so that we can follow you and get updates on the content that you're producing and anytime you expand what you're offering to educators. It is invaluable, you know, um, as MasterCard says, priceless. Oh, let me get that link for you, Helen. It's also on our Gwen link because I just added it in there. I updated it. So I saw people talking before about why not go to New Orleans, and we, of course, love New Orleans and done a good article on it, but I'll try and paste the uh, URL too. It's about educational travel to New Orleans. Oh, cool. There are just so many resources. I mean, we could go on for days talking about the different things that you offer at your site, Mark, and the great work that your team is doing to produce all of this content for us. Yeah, we uh, we really do have a great team of uh, committed and passionate people working for it. Um, they really just amaze me with their enthusiasm and, and professionalism and dedication to it. And uh, you know, the initial idea was mine, but many of the other ones came from them. Well, get, thank them for us, too, because we, we know that, you know, every great year there is a team involved in, in the support and evaluating the content for any quality project. Are there any other questions before we let Mark go for the day? We're excited that about using the site and the content and cannot wait for the sweet search engine to be fixed on Monday. And Sal, you have the microphone. So uh, go ahead and go ahead and go ahead, Sal, click on your microphone. Thanks for your presentation, Mark. It's been wonderful. I've loved it. My question is, would you consider giving webinars for teachers? Uh, most definitely. I, uh, I take advantage of almost every opportunity to, to speak to teachers. I've been going into some classes and schools in the New York area as well and, and to conferences. Um, we went to AASL and NCSS in the fall and, and plan to be at a number of other conferences this year as well. But yeah, I'd absolutely love to do a webinar for teachers. So just contact me and rearrange that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, um, I've also, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Sal, did you have another content, another question to ask? No, but I lost uh, the sound. Okay, no one was talking at that moment. Um, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I, I said I can hear. I I, uh, I didn't have anything to add. If there's a question, I'm happy to take it. 
And that's a good point, Tammy, that uh, when a, a girl stays home from shopping to listen to the web to this webinar, you know that it was great value. <laughs> Carol T. said she stayed home. She sent her husband to the mall. <laughs> <laughs> she may regret it when he comes home. <laughs> Especially if he goes to Sears or Home Depot or something. Right. Are you at ISTE this summer? Uh, um, I haven't looked at that one yet, but I certainly will take a look. Okay, because I know the presentations are closed, but um, Steve Hargadon offers um, like a strand of pre of presenting that are free, at, and it's called uh, ISTE Unplugged, uh -huh. and you'll use the and there'll be a special area, and you can sign up for the schedule to present similar to this. Yeah. Okay. Um, ISTE Unplugged is, I think, throughout the duration of the conference. So the, the it's the, like June 27th or 26th. That Saturday is the Edgy Blogger Con, and then that Sunday through Wednesday or Thursday is the actual conference. So I remember there were two or three days full of sessions from morning. Till afternoon, just back to back. So, okay. Um, so look for we'll, that. Uh, we'll take a look at that. Yes, 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 definitely. Looks like it may conflict with ALA, so we'd have to make a decision. Okay. It seems the largest national educators uh, tech, ed tech conference in the United States. So. Okay. You'll be reaching a very large audience. Okay, but uh, we certainly like to take advantage of those opportunities. Definitely, definitely. If not this year, then next, to be able to present um, a session. Right, right. Yeah, we're presenting at the uh, the National Social Studies Conferences in Denver in November, and then we're uh, talking about a few others in the fall. Okay, because ISTE's going to be at Denver this summer. Right. So. Okay. Well, this has been so fantastic, Mark. We are so glad that you uh, joined us and took time to share all of your resources. We can't wait for Google to get their end together so that we can use these resources. And that's great that you put in your email. Just direct any of your questions to Mark, or if you'd like him to present for a webinar or or a session somewhere for you, just let him know. And be sure to join us next week for little 12 year old to be presenting Adora's Speed Tech if you haven't ever heard her. Um, she's been described as a child prodigy and I can definitely concur with that. Um, I have heard her speak two or three times and it's just amazing. So we encourage everybody to join us next Saturday at the same time. So have a great day or evening wherever you are in the world, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Kim. Really enjoyed Thanks. it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.